If we presume that the pattern of evolutionary relationships shown in this tree is the correct one, one way to correct what is presently a bad taxonomy is to reclassify the two jackals at the bottom into their own genus, something other than Canis. And Wikipedia notes that some scientists are leaning toward this resolution by reclassifying the two at the bottom into their own genus, Lupulella. Lupulella adustus and Lupulella mesomalus, rather than their current placement within the genus Canis. A second and equally valid resolution would be to recognize all the species in this tree in the genus Canis, and this would require reclassifying the dole and the African wild dog within the genus. Getting back to the issue of what makes taxonomy a science, think about just why it is we care about naming these animals properly. What constitutes a proper or correct naming of the animals in the first place? If classification were a purely subjective enterprise, then there could be no wrong answers in taxonomy because there would be no singular natural truth that the classification is attempting to represent. The fact that we argue and find ourselves needing to rename organisms from time to time is testimony to how taxonomy is a science, subject to continual validation by evidence from the real world. Okay, so let's take a look at your notes to this point in the lecture. They should be enough to remind you of the main points of nested hierarchies, what they are, and how our brains might predispose us to impose them onto things we encounter regardless of whether or not there actually is a nested organization. And with your notes, you should be able to demonstrate that the nested hierarchy applies to traditional rank-based taxonomy. And you should be able to explain how it has elements that are both objective and subjective. It is based around a goal of representing an objective natural truth, while at the same time there are subjective decisions that must be made in determining how membership within the ranks are defined. Levels of biological organization. I'm going to follow up on the nested hierarchy theme with a traditional first day of the semester topic covered in chapter one of probably every general biology textbook ever published. The levels of biological organization is another example of a nested hierarchy. There are atoms making up a molecule, which is part of the makeup of a cell, which is part of the makeup of an organism, which is part of the makeup of a population of organisms. Chapter one of your textbook will give you a more complete picture, but here are the main bits. There is a complete spectrum of levels in the structural hierarchy, and we'll start in the middle with the cell, because, hey, this is a biology class. And the cell is the fundamental unit of life. You should have heard this before. Sometimes a cell is the same as an individual organism. This is true for amoebae and bacteria and yeasts and all the unicellular microbes. But there are also a lot of life forms with multicellular structure, in which case the multicellular organism is a higher level on the organizational diagram than the cell. Organisms be they unicellular or multicellular, form populations, which exist with other populations of different species comprising ecological communities. Going back to the cell, we can work downward to lower levels in the hierarchy. A cell is made up of many component biological molecules like proteins and nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, phospholipids, and all the rest. And these molecules, in turn, are made up of atoms, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and a handful of others. You could go farther and note that atoms are made up of subatomic particles that are themselves made up of even smaller things like quarks or maybe superstrings. But that's a different field of science. Let's leave that for your instructor in particle physics to address. Chapter one in your textbook will undoubtedly have levels in between these levels, like organelle, between biological molecule and cell, and tissue, organ, and organ system between cell and multicellular organism. I didn't write them on the board here, but feel free to include them in your notes. The first thing to point out here is that there isn't much need to discuss whether or not this is a real, naturally validated hierarchy, 
because it has the advantage of being observable from physical entities of the real world, unlike the more conceptual hierarchies that we've discussed so far. There's no question of whether a given cell in your body is a part of a multicellular organism that's you, rather than that of a different multicellular organism, right? And there's no question that an oxygen atom in a fossil lipid of that cell is part of that fossil lipid rather than a different molecule in a different cell. That whole debate we had about taxonomic classification representing a real hierarchy or not, we don't need to have that discussion here, right? Second, there is something infinitely more fascinating about this hierarchy for biological systems as compared with non-biological ones. You can say that the same type of structural hierarchy occurs in geology. Instead of cell, you can substitute grain of sand, which makes up a chunk of sandstone rather than multicellular organism. And this is part of a whole geologic formation rather than population. The grain of sand is composed of a variety of mineral crystals, which are made up of atoms. The nested hierarchy is not unique to biology. This geologic example is just as valid as the one we drew up for biological organization. As we think about life and what makes life different from non-life, and why not? This is the first day of a biology class. We use the structural hierarchy in life to make note of the dominant theme of emergence. Specifically, an emergent property is an attribute of a unit in the hierarchy that cannot be understood or predicted from only knowledge about its components. For example, you could know everything there is to know about all of the individual molecules making up a cell, and yet, without knowledge of how the cell functions as a whole, you'd be at a loss to predict its critical cellular behaviors and abilities. These are the emergent properties of the cell. If you knew everything about each of the individual cells making up a worm, would you, without any information about a whole worm, that is not knowing what a worm is or what it does, would you be able to predict the critical attributes of the worm just from the attributes of its component cells? Generally, when we look at the structural hierarchy of biological systems, emergent properties are abundant, and they're at nearly every step in the hierarchy. Sometimes this theme stretches even above the level of multicellular organism. For example, with ants or termites or any of these social insects, knowledge of the individual ant, the multicellular organism, is not enough to predict the critical behaviors and capabilities of the collective of organisms, the ant colony. Now, in contrast to all of this, if you were to look at our non-biological example, there is little to no emergence at all. Once you know the attributes of a grain of sand, you could easily put together a near-complete prediction of the physical and chemical properties of a piece of sandstone that's made up of several millions of these sand grains. Non-biological systems don't have this recurrent theme of emergence and emergent properties. Biological systems do, and you could say that this is one important defining characteristic of life. Now, putting this structural hierarchy into a historical perspective, it hasn't always had so many levels. The Earth is around 4.6 billion years old. For the first few hundreds of millions of years, there would have been atoms and, yes, simple molecules, and that's it. Call this the time of atoms and molecules only. The rest of the hierarchy didn't exist. Later, there would have to have been larger biological molecules forming through spontaneous abiotic means, and from that, the first cells formed. This happened probably about 4 billion years ago. But multicellular organisms would not exist for some time, not until around 1.5 billion years ago. In other words, this spectrum of many levels of biological organization had to build up stepwise over time, starting at the right and building in the direction towards the left.
but this would not have been a slow and steady build. You can't be 22% cellular and then 35% cellular. It's an all or none thing. You're either a cell or you're not. And the very first appearance of cellular life was a zero to hero thing and a monumental event in the history of the earth. Cells are capable of metabolizing raw materials and converting energy and replicating to produce more cells. They have the ability to evolve by natural selection and the ability to populate what had formerly been a lifeless planet. We know that by 3.5 billion years ago, there were thick mats of bacterial slime, cellular life, that became the stromatolite fossils of the Strelly Pool Chert in Australia. From a singular origin, cellular life became rich and diverse quickly, and it has remained so for the time since. But for the next two billion years or so, life was entirely microbial, successful and very diverse, but still exclusively microbial and unicellular. But when multicellular life takes hold roughly 1.5 billion years ago, things become qualitatively different. The three main groups of multicellular life forms known today, fungi, animals, and plants, appear all around the same time and enjoy great success diversifying and populating the Earth with big, easy-to-see life. You can take these two events, the origin of cellular life four billion years ago, or roundabouts, and the origin of multicellular life 1.5 billion years ago, as being evolution for sure, but not of the garden variety kinds of evolutionary change that we'll be learning about in the first unit of Bio 202 and thinking about throughout the rest of the semester. We will envision evolution as processes through which populations change over a period of generations, or species split and become different over the course of thousands to millions of generations. Whatever the case, we'll stay at the same level in the structural hierarchy. We might start with a generic dog species, a multicellular organism, and end up with 10 distinct species of jackal, dog, wolf, etc all still multicellular organisms. So we're not creating anything new as far as this hierarchy is concerned. But if you look at our diagram at this juncture right here, about four billion years ago, we're starting without cells and ending with cellular life, a whole new level in the structural hierarchy. It's only from this point in time onward that you can have the kind of evolutionary change we focus on in this class. It's a turning point in the history of life, a major evolutionary transition, or sometimes it's called a metasystem transition. Life is taking a quantum step upward in the structural hierarchy, and a brand new era of biology begins. Similarly, with the transition 1.5 billion years ago from unicellular to multicellular, we are seeing one, the next level up in the structural hierarchy, and also two, the beginning of a new era in the history of life, one in which there are multicellular organisms to go along with the unicellular ones. Calling these two events major evolutionary transitions is easy enough to understand. I mentioned that they are also called metasystem transitions, and this deserves some explanation. The prefix meta in this case means beyond, and refers to a grouping of a unit or system at a level in the hierarchy. For example, if we take cell as the system or unit, then a grouping of cells would be a metasystem. When the metasystem becomes its own unit in the hierarchy, that's the metasystem transition. When is a grouping of cells something more than, that is beyond, just a grouping of cells? Well, it's when the cells are working together in some way that results in critical behaviors and abilities that are somehow not predicted from the cells operating individually. That sound familiar? Why, yes, that is exactly how we think of emergent properties. The multicellular organism becomes its own thing. Truly interesting only when it's more than just a cluster of cells in the absence of emergent properties. By calling it a metasystem transition, you're basically acknowledging the role that emergence and emergent properties play 
in these world-changing evolutionary events. Finally, given that this is a class taken by biology majors, I like to point out that biology is so damn big that no one is ever able to master the entire range. No one really tries because the scope is way too huge. Someone specializing in community ecology is not likely to be keeping up on the latest findings in cellular and developmental biology. And a biochemist is unlikely to be able to tell you much about how crabs ventilate their gill chambers. In the Bio 202-204 sequence, we sort of break things into cells and things bigger than a cell. That's Bio 202, this class. And cells and things smaller than a cell. That's Bio 204, which you have either taken already or will be taking next semester. Maybe a couple of you are foolish. Oops, I meant ambitious. Enough to take both in the same term. But besides the difference in which parts of the biological spectrum are covered, there's also an inherent tendency in the disciplines focusing on the right side, like those of greater emphasis in Bio 204, to take a more reductionist approach, while those disciplines on the left side, that's our side, to take a more holistic approach. These two terms deserve explanation. Reductionism, specifically methodological reductionism, because if you ask a philosopher, there are other flavors that could make things confusing. We'll just say reductionism and use it to mean the approach where we explain things through an examination of their component parts. For example, we can learn about a cell by studying the organelles and molecules making up the cell. And we can further study these molecules by learning more about the underlying chemistry that allows them to do whatever it is that they do. Looking for knowledge in smaller and smaller component entities is basically the approach of scientists following methodological reductionism. Holism, on the other hand, puts greater emphasis on context, acknowledging that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So a reductionist might study a rabbit by dissecting it or dismantling it into ever smaller units, but that only gives you part of the picture. You need to see the rabbit within the context of its population and community of food plants, predators, competitors, in order to truly understand what a rabbit is. Evolutionary biology is also an inherently holistic science in that it focuses on the context within which a rabbit took shape over the course of its evolutionary history. Bio 202 puts its emphasis on the organismal, ecological, and evolutionary. We will be the yin to Bio 204's yang, differing not only on the side of the biological spectrum, left as opposed to right, but also in the fundamental way that we think about things. I think it's fair and honest for me to point out that the majority of science-savvy students entering Bio 202 are more comfortable with a reductionist approach. In all likelihood, that's the way you've learned science in the past and it may be the way that you'll be approaching science for the rest of your career, in school and beyond. In fact, this semester may be the one time in your life in which you're actually required to think about the organismal context, the ecological and evolutionary contexts for the biological phenomena that you study. This is actually my presumption as I put together the content for this class. I am anticipating that this will be your only exposure to the bigger side of biology, and I want to make the most of it. So now, you're probably wondering what happens next. If you're actually in my class, and not just viewing this lecture because you came across it on YouTube, you will have done all the questions that were incorporated into the playback of this video. This is my way of holding you accountable for completing the lectures before coming to class for our discussion of the lecture content. I know this was the first lecture, so a handful of you won't be getting to this until after our first meeting. That's okay this time, but for all future lectures, you need to have them done prior to the scheduled meeting. Later than that, the points you get for the questions in the video playback go down, penalized by 50%. At our class meetings, I'll be using a variety of methods to reinforce the content of the lecture.
There will likely be a few slides with questions for you to answer on the spot. There might be some group activities done in breakout rooms, and sometimes the best direction for me to take will be to rehash some of the same instruction from lecture, particularly on points that students found unclear or needing further explanation. I recommend that if you have questions about something in the lecture videos, don't presume that I'll know that you had that difficulty. Come to class ready to ask your questions. At our synchronous class meetings, I will sometimes add content that is not included in the lecture videos. On occasion, I will be giving you small graded challenges, sort of like pop quizzes, only without the stress, because you're not required to complete them on the spot. All of this may happen starting with our first class meeting, and again for this video, you're okay if you don't get to it until after the meeting. But do complete the videos before the scheduled live discussion for all future lectures. For students who, by choice or necessity, don't show up at our synchronous Zoom meetings, you still need to complete the videos before the scheduled lecture discussion, even if you aren't going to be present at the discussion live. The deadline for completion of videos and the accompanying quizzes is the starting time of our live meeting. If you go to the Canvas site, you'll find some lecture questions that you can use to evaluate the completeness of your notes for this lecture. This isn't a comprehensive study guide for the exam, but you should be able to answer these questions initially using your notes. When you're in exam preparation mode, plan on being able to answer them even without referring to your notes on exam day. If you do this, I'm sure you'll be comfortable with most, if not all, of the exam questions.